chapter of the New Mexico Green Chamber of Commerce. And uh, it seems a, a little redundant to introduce the senator. Again. So don't spend a lot of time. Right? <laughs> <laughs> because we need to get to the merits here. <laughs> Former Secretary of Energy Stephen Chu said, technology transfer is an important part of what we do. It is part of the reason why we are being funded, and now more than ever, we think that scientists need to come to the aid of our country. By most economic measurements, the state of New Mexico doesn't typically rank very high. But we are an incredibly rich state. If you look around this room, you can see how intellectually wealthy we are. We are blessed with three national laboratories, and institutions of higher learning that are creating some of the world's leading innovations and technologies. New Mexico is also blessed with abundant renewable energy. According to the Western Governors Association, we are the highest in the country, with 27,000 megawatts of solar, wind, and geothermal energy potential. We have a huge opportunity in this region because we have these research labs in our backyard and because we have vast access to this energy. Some of the new technologies are addressing national interests and issues, things like energy storage and energy security. Technology typically leads to jobs, economic development and sustainability, but not just jobs. This is an economic development in industries that are ideal for operating with the triple bottom line philosophy, mindful of people, the planet, and profit. A philosophy that the New Mexico Green Chamber of Commerce embraces and advocates for as part of our mission. We have some of our board members here today. I hope you have a chance to meet with them. As we speak, our labs are working on and have technologies available for licensing in energy storage, in solar thermal, solar PV, wind energy, smart grid, and microgrid technology, as well as energy efficiency, which is the low-hanging fruit that we always aspire to get to. The value of transferring and commercializing these technologies should be apparent to each and every one of you. But the technology transfer process must be streamlined, and it must be accelerated for companies to be willing to invest and in the development and marketing of these different processes, these different products and different inventions. This process also needs to be accessible to small companies as it is to large corporations. New Mexico is poised right now to become a leader in the renewable energy sector, but we can't do it without help in Washington. I first met Tom Udall in 1998. I was fortunate enough to be uh, invited to a fundraiser for a would-be congressman by my past employer, Robert Redford, who for some reason gets invited to a lot of those things. <laughs> Through that connection, I learned of Tom's love for New Mexico and for his commitment to protecting our land, our air, and our water. Tom has earned a reputation as a principled leader with integrity to do what is right for New Mexico and our nation. Tom was elected as a U.S. Senator in 2009 after two decades of public service. He has been a strong advocate for New Mexico and for clean energy and environment, for affordable and accessible health care, and for our nation's veterans. Tom graduated from Prescott College, Cambridge University, and the University of New Mexico Law School. He was elected New Mexico Attorney General in 1990 and elected to represent the 3rd Congressional District in 1998. Tom now serves on five committees, Appropriations, Foreign Relations, Environment and Public Works, Rules and Administration, and Indian Affairs. It's my honor to welcome Senator Tom Neal. Glenn, thank you uh, very much for that very kind introduction. And, and uh, let me uh, uh, just thank once again all the panelists and the, and the great brain power we have in the room. This, to me, this has been very, very impressive in terms of the conference. And because uh, I'm reordering my remarks a little bit, because on the last panel we didn't have enough in terms of interaction and questions. 
I'm going to shorten some of this, and, and, and I'm going to assume that you did your homework. If you haven't done your homework while I'm talking here, pull out and, and go through uh, the parts of the bill, because I, I want to uh, turn the, the, um, the, the last half of this into a, a, a real discussion as to uh, your additional ideas, what you think needs to be in the bill, how we can improve it. But first of all, approaching this from 30,000 feet, um, I, I can't believe, in a way, that since 2009, federal funding for R&D has dropped to half the share of GDP that it was in 1960. Uh, spending on education and training is a lower percentage of the federal budget than it was in the 1980s. Uh, the World Economic Forum ranked U.S. infrastructure second in the world in 2001. Now where are we? 24th. Uh, in the 1970s, our nation had the most college graduates in the world. Now, where are we? 14. Uh, we should be moving ahead in all of these areas, uh, not falling behind. And that, that's uh, one of the things that, that I've been working on in Washington, all my committees, starting with the Appropriations Committee, to make sure that we put the resources into uh, these vital areas that, that impact uh, the subject we've gathered around today. Uh, and today what we've heard about um, are the challenges of tech transfer, challenges that entrepreneurs uh, face every day. Uh, finding the people with the right mix of skills, knowledge, and expertise, uh, developing and protecting or licensing technology, making a product commercially viable, uh, something so important to uh, getting things going here again in New Mexico, improving the department's, uh, Department of Energy's uh, tech transfer mission, how to connect people with business, technology, and mentors, and to uh, technology developed at our R&D institutions. And we need to provide a pathway for them for financing, and we heard that on many of our panels, talking about how do we, uh, how do we move this forward. It has to be with investments. Uh, and one thing is clear to me. New Mexico's entrepreneurs don't give up easy. Uh, they are just as tough as they come, which is why today is also about opportunities, about how tech transfer creates jobs and creates growth for New Mexico. We have represented here and around our state incredible institutions, the University of New Mexico, New Mexico Tech, New Mexico State University, Santa Fe Community College, and the two labs that have participated here. Each of these centers of innovation plays an important role, but the story cannot end with research and development. Tech transfer is the bridge from R&D, a bridge that creates opportunities and promotes new industry. And I, and I want to say a few words to show you the, the kind of um, a development we've had in one specific area, and this is the bioscience growth. One of those industries in New Mexico is biofuels and biotechnologies. This success story goes back to our centers of innovation. Just in the Albuquerque area alone, uh, we've had uh, 130 biotech companies, and, and many more across the states. We have great startup hubs, like the Bioscience Center and the Santa Fe Business <laughs> Incubator. These local and regional partnerships produce real results. Since 1998, the Santa Fe Business Incubator has helped over 100 companies, totaling over $100 million in revenue. They've cleared more than $40 million in payroll. That's paychecks to over 1,000 hardworking folks with new jobs, with a living wage to take home to their families. The bioscience industry in New Mexico employs over 7,400 people in over 500 companies. These are high-tech and high-paying jobs with an annual salary of over $70,000 a year. We've seen tremendous growth in bioscience, up 67% from 2001 to 2010. These are the kinds of success stories we want to support, and that's why uh, we're working on this piece of legislation, and we hope to have your input. We're, I, the first thing I would emphasize, this is a draft. We want to work with you. We've been work, working with many of you already, uh, but we're unveiling a draft with the intent uh, to work through it. 
Uh, so, assuming you've done your homework, let's go to slide one here, which I, I, uh, I think we have up on the screen. Um, and, uh, and slide one really, uh, more than anything, uh, emphasizes DOE's tech transfer efforts can be uh, unorganized and difficult to navigate. Some people with inside knowledge uh, can navigate the system, while others may feel left out. DOE recently announced a new tech transfer office, which you heard one of our panelists talk about. Uh, the bill is clear about how important this priority is and what we expect from this office. It should reorganize and consolidate existing efforts and work directly with tech transfer office, offices uh, at each national laboratory. Let's go to slide two now. Um, this part of it you also heard in, in the panels. Uh, in the discussion where the, Fred Mondragon, I think, asked the question about uh, is, is it in your DNA or can you learn it? And, and Fred, the answer you got back was a little bit of a combination of both. It's in your DNA, but it sure helps to have a mentor and, and it sure helps to have support. And so what we're talking about here is trying to give that support uh, to these entrepreneurs and we're using a model that's worked in other agencies and that's what this E squared corps of the core is all about, entrepreneurs in the energy core. And then finally, uh, third uh, slide there, uh, the tech transfer uh, investment initiative. And we heard the term over and over again. If we could get a few a little funds, if we could get a little resources, if we could get uh, uh, some help in this area, it could make a real difference. And so what we do in this bill um, is, is look at, at uh, what they've done in several other agencies that worked and created uh, the Tech Transfer Initiative Venture Capital Investment Fund and the Tech Transfer Initiative Equity Investment Fund, uh, which I think will help move us forward. So with that, um, I'm going to open the floor. Craig Connolly, who's worked a lot with me on this, and if you're going to give us input, Craig's right over here. Uh, I want to thank him very much for all the effort in reaching out to, uh, to the labs and the research institutions in New Mexico and, and all of you individually. For they, so for this time, until my staff gives me the hook, I either want to hear comments, questions, thoughts, discussion. Uh, Susan, go ahead, and we'll, we'll, we will once again uh, rotate some uh, microphones around here. I, I can. Okay. Uh, how much no. money are you talking about uh, in the authorization? Bill? I didn't see that. No. So what's okay. the what are you starting at? Craig, what what grab a you know, go ahead there. So I know you guys are all well aware of the, the financial situation in DC. We're going to try to do the, best we can. The, the draft bill has about twenty five million dollars for the VC fund. It'll be highly leveraged by outside um, public private partnerships, and the equity fund will be about the same size. So fifty million dollars total between the two funds with cost share or kind of private sector leverage, if you will, upwards of five to one is the hope. When we get a really good partner to help us, like a Chase Manhattan type bank or a big bank that's doing this type of investment, we want them to bring money to the table so that we can really leverage that uh, public money as best we can. And the, and the whole idea, that may sound small, Susan, but, but as you know, I mean, with, uh, you've worked in this area a lot, if you have real government dollars, you can leverage them a lot and you can push out there and sometimes do 10 times, 20 times. So, thank you. That's a good, very good point. Yeah. Is that Gloria back there? Yeah, Gloria, please. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Gloria Chavez, president of a small company, started 2006, Trinitech Services. I'm also a labs graduate, spent 29 years at Sandia, five at Idaho, uh, I got an R&D 100 on my way out when I graduated from Sandia. And and so, um, you know, I firmly support all these tech transfer ideas. And I would suggest that, that we need to work on the follow-on, which Dr. Ellig mentioned earlier, which is that uh, small companies find themselves competing against the national labs. There are sometimes small level of effort projects, especially in tech training, maybe two FTE or a dozen FTE sort of level of effort, and we find that these small businesses that originally spun off from the labs now find themselves competing for work against the labs. And so I would like to make sure that there are 
maybe some more protection in some place or consider ways that some work that the labs are doing that can be done by these small companies are actually given to the small companies to do. Look, Gloria, thank you for those comments, and we'd, we'd like to work with you on that specific <laughs> Jack Joukowsky with IDP in Albuquerque. Thank you for coming today and, and supporting this. Thank we, you for coming, Jack. We talked a little bit about the university engagement in this whole initiative. Uh, this has been an area where the labs have really struggled over the years. They've worked hard. We can cite many individual little pockets of success where the labs have engaged our research universities in particular, but higher ed in general. And I, I, I look back at the Oak Ridge model with the University of Tennessee and their engagement with the National Laboratory really now as a uh, contracting partner. Uh, but is there anything that you can do in this legislation or another legislation that might encourage that? And in particular, the research universities now are facing a conundrum where to get research grants from the federal government, many uh, agencies are requiring cost share. And New Mexico, just like other states, are suffering in their ability to provide that in addition to the funding that's needed to keep the doors open. And is there any way that we can work that issue as well? Thank you. And I think we should work that issue. You know, one of the first uh, uh, people I'm going to be reaching out to is Senator Lamar Alexander. Uh, Lamar uh, is, is, was a governor down there. He's now the uh, senior senator. Uh, he has a a huge interest in this area, and I think he would bring a lot of the issues you're talking about uh, into the table and be able to help us with the legislation. We're hoping to have him as an original co-sponsor on it, and we're going to work with all. You know, the, the wonderful thing about this in terms of finding bipartisanship and working Democrats and Republicans together in the Senate is where the national labs are situated, uh, it isn't all... Democrat or all Republican, there's a, there's a real mix. And, and each one of those senators, as, I, as I've seen over my last four and a half years, have a real interest in the national labs. They have an interest in tech transfer. They have an interest in, in growing jobs at this time in our history. So we want to work with you on that. Uh, yeah, Sherman, please. Thank you for hosting this today very much. This is, this is needed in New Mexico. I appreciate you doing this. Well, thank you for your, your technology ventures being involved in this. So let me ask, uh, one of the, I think one of the things a lot of people have been disappointed with over the last 8 or 10 or 12 years is that Congress does in fact pass statutes for the Department of Energy around technology commercialization. And for whatever reason, the Department of Energy does not implement or does not fund or procrastinates for several years. Uh, these are all absolutely sterling ideas, but there may be some need for something to encourage the Department of Energy to carry out the, carry out the will of, of Congress. You know, and when Senator Bingham and uh, under the under the statute that, that created the Director of Tech Transfer. It took almost five years to get one appointed, and then after one was appointed, it was, you know, you know all these stories. So if there's something that you could add that, that says, if you don't do these things... <laughs> well, no, that's good. That's a very good exception. It's, it's kind of a negative incentive, is what you're talking about, right? We've talked about incentives, but a negative incentive. The other thing, I, you, you remind me in a way, Sherman, of, it, it reminds me again of Lamar Alexander. He calls, calls it running it up the flagpole. Uh, and everybody in Washington kept wondering, well, what does he mean? Well, what, what he means is, is, as governor, what he, he learned is he would get all these great ideas. Like he'd get into conference like this and people would tell him, and he'd say to all his people in the room, go out and do this, go out and do this. And then a year later, he would say, you remember we were in the room and we said we were going to go do this. Who did it? And he found out it was because nobody was accountable. Nobody, nobody in their specific job, it said, you, you are uh, required this year to do everything you can to recreate 100 jobs uh, through tech transfer. And at the end of the year, if you only create 50, we want to know why. But somebody's accountable, and that's what he means, is running it up the flagpole. And that's 
one of the concepts we need to be thinking about is, is real, true accountability in this and making sure that we have uh, the kind of exchange that, that uh, you're talking about between uh, what we put in legislation, what we say we're going to do, and specifically a real action. Uh, so we have time for a couple of more questions here, or comments, or just, you know, please go well, ahead. I, I'm curious about the timetable on all of this. Yeah. Well, I mean, with the SBIR program, we talk about focusing the topics. Yes. The SBIR topics, uh, they go into the RFPs a year or so before they ever implement it. So I'm interested in the timetable on these deliverables, yeah. essentially. How do we coordinate that? Yeah. The, the, uh, well, the one timetable is where, and I think I said this earlier, but maybe I said it in the press conference and I should repeat it. We're going to take the next two months still work in progress on the bill and getting it in in, in, in terms of uh, uh, about October the 15th is a launch on the bill and reaching out to Lamar and Democrats and Republicans across the country. Craig, do you have any thoughts on, on additional uh, things that she was... Uh, one of the things that we could really use some help with from you guys is we know that you have a whole lot of expertise in tech transfer and that your contacts and network expands beyond this room. And one of the things that we'll need some help with gearing up towards October is getting other people interested. So this is just the kickoff for this draft. So not only can you give us feedback today, but we're really interested in you helping us get this attention for tech transfer that's needed nationally. It's one of those issues that's kind of swept under the rug, and we think that you can really help get the word out. So that's something that everybody in this room could take away and do did, to help us with that. Did we answer your question? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, one more. Let's do one more. Fred, go ahead. Jump in again. John, we'll do two more. Yeah. Senator, again, thank you for being here today. Um, so a comment and a question. And the comment would be, you know, we, we talked about biotechnology and other areas that are, you know, uh, very, very fertile grounds here in New Mexico with medical school and other activities. But a further comment is this is a national security issue. It's a national security issue in terms of our balance of trades, in terms of our, quote, enemies that are, you know, going to be outstanding us in cybersecurity and other areas. So where... I know this is focused on energy, or at least that's what the words say. Where can we tie in things like nanotechnology, cybersecurity, advanced materials development, and things like that, to make sure that it doesn't just become an energy issue? Uh, I think that's an area that, that, that we need to work on. I think, yeah, I think that's a very valid comment, and, and we'd like to work with you on that. And John, why don't you, you go ahead? Since I Shorten that a little so you could. Yeah, I, I apologize for pointing in at the end. Well, no, um, no, no, please. This is I, since '97. I've been starting companies, and, and uh, this is. Thank you very much for sponsoring a bill like this. I can, in my personal experience, attest that it can make a major impact. Um, this is a suggestion for something that you might consider as part of the bill. Uh, a, a little background: the, the universities that are commercial powerhouses, MIT, Stanford. They have programs where their professors uh, can uh, start companies uh, as a side job, essentially. Uh, and uh, they have programs that, that actually subdivide a laboratory bench to, uh, you know, this side belongs to the company and this side belongs to the university. Uh, that would be very valuable to try and incorporate into the national laboratories. The national laboratories would have huge institutional roadblocks to allowing uh, laboratory scientists to be involved in a company on the side. Uh, conflict of interest, fairness of opportunity, all of those uh, would have to be addressed. It would take an, an, an act of Congress. Which <laughs> 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 fortunately this is. So, so you might want to think about uh, uh, whether or not you can give the laboratory some cover for allowing scientists, and this changed off my, my earlier question, or my earlier comments on the panel to, to get involved in startups around their own technology. No, no that's that's a, a very uh, valuable comment, and I think I think one of the things that, to me encouraging in New Mexico, our our new uh, president at the University of New Mexico is very interested in in the synergy between the labs, uh, the university. Uh, and growing jobs, and, and he's already pushing his office that does this 
uh, to interact, and I think he's pushing it to a, a new level. Uh, I know our, our president here, President Guzman, she is uh, very interested in that in terms of the community college. Uh, Dan Lopez uh, down at New Mexico Tech. I mean, we, we have folks in our uh, higher education institutions that are, that are, that are very interested in, in doing this. So um, with that, let me uh, um, just uh, thank you all again. We really appreciate you coming together. Uh, as Craig uh, said, and I just want to reiterate too, uh, we need your additional help as we move down the line uh, to hone this down and, and to get it just right. I know we have a representative here from here from uh, NREL, right? From Colorado, uh, the lab up there that's uh, uh, up there doing renewable energy research. Uh, they, we, we're going to be engaging all of the labs around the country to see uh, what it is that uh, uh, we need to do to really push this technology transfer. So thank you for being here. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Randy, and, and uh, Randy will tell everybody what's uh, on, on the rest of the schedule. Thanks again, and, and really appreciate it.